Okay, hi everyone. Uh, back for another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. I noticed we have a um, question already from Mahmoud asking about how Alan Turing cracked the Enigma code. Well, let's see how I can do on telling that story. So, this was something happened during World War II and uh, the Enigma code was a code used by the uh, uh, Germans by the Axis powers um, uh, and it was uh, a code which they used to send messages to like military commanders saying go attack this hill or do go do this thing um, and the point was that if somebody intercepted so they were sending radio signals and uh, if somebody intercepted their radio signals they didn't want anybody to be able to hear or understand what they were saying so what they did was to send messages in code. So they would send, it was using Morse code, which is dots and dashes, you know, like, like uh, I don't know, E is a dot, T is a dash. Uh, I don't know that much Morse code. S is a um, dot, dot, dot. Um, the, the, that was a way to, inc uh, to um, represent the alphabet in a way that you could um, sort of send in a, like in a digital way, except that we didn't yet have computers and things like that. But the question was, if you just sent uh, plain text, just ordinary uh, pieces of German, whatever language, um, uh, then anybody who could pick up the radio signal could understand what you were saying. And if it says, we're going to attack in this place, you kind of don't want to or go attack in this place. You don't want the enemy, um, in that case, the allies, to understand what you said, so to speak, um, because otherwise they'd be able to take action on the basis of that. So the idea in, in military cryptography is you want to be able to send uh, orders and things in a way that's encoded so your enemy can't, uh, uh, can't tell what you're saying. So how did the Germans actually do this in World War II? Um, they used this machine called the Enigma, which is actually, I think, developed in Sweden originally. Um, and uh, the machine is a, has a collection of rotors. And what happens is that um, you basically have, um, you, you, it, has a, it has sort of a keyboard like a typewriter, um, and uh, it's, a, it's an electromechanical device. You press a button, and uh, like, a, like you press an A, and then what happens is these rotors move into different positions and depending on where the rotors kind of end up, that A is turned into a V, let's say. You tighten another A and that will be turned into an X, let's say, and, and, you, and, and you go on. So the most naive kind of way that you could um, uh, encode a message, um, it's actually often called a Caesar cipher. It's said that Julius Caesar used this method of enciphering Latin in that case. Not completely sure if that's uh, historically correct, but it certainly existed around that time. So what um, the Caesar cipher does is you take a word like, I don't know, C-A-T, cat, right? And what you do is you take, you remember the order of the alphabet and you say to each letter, I'm going to add a fixed number, uh, I'm going to add, a. I'm, I'm going to make it increment a fixed number of steps in the alphabet. So let's say it's two steps. So C would turn into D, E. A would turn into C. T would turn into V. So that means that cat, C-A-T, would turn into, let me get it right, E, C, uh, V. Okay. So when Caesar was sending his Latin dispatches to his generals and so on. He, it is said, would encode it by using a, uh, a Caesar cipher where he would shift every letter some number of places in the alphabet. And, and when you get to Z, it would shift back again to A and so on. And then, so what had to happen was whoever received that, they would have to know how many letters was it shifted by Oh, it was shifted by five letters. Okay, then they can take the thing they received, they just sort of subtract five, they shift back five places for each letter, and then they've got the original message. So that, that how many letters to shift by is called the key to the cipher, the key to the, the cryptography. So the, um, the notion, 
So that's sort of a very, very simple kind of, uh, of encryption. It's just you take the letters, you shift it over by a certain amount. Now, if you were given one of these uh, ciphers and you didn't know what the shifting was by, it's actually pretty easy to do cryptanalysis, to break that code. How would you do it? Well, one thing, at least in English, I don't know what the corresponding result is in Latin, but at least in English, we know that E is the most common letter to appear. T is the next most common letter. So if you know that everything has been shifted by a fixed number of letters, and you look on at a, a message, and you see that, uh, for example, H is the most common letter, then you know, okay, H is the encrypted version of E, and so that tells us how much shifting there is, and we can go and apply that shift to everything, and we can decode everything. So that's a way of doing cryptanalysis for a Caesar cipher. So that was in in, um, in antiquity. One of the approaches was the Caesar cipher. Uh, something that showed up, I think, in the 1400s or something, was a so-called Vignier cipher, and that had the idea that instead of just shifting by a fixed number of letters, what you would do is through the message you would shift by progressively more letters. So for example, at the beginning of the message, you might be shifting by three letters, then the next letter you might shift by three plus two, the next letter you might shift by three plus two plus two and so on. And so that kind of scrambles things up, up a bit more, but then by probably the 1700s, 1800 or so, people, people knew how to break vignette ciphers. It's not too difficult. Uh, if you kind of think about things in terms of probabilities and so on, it's not too difficult to break that. So then, what happened by the 1920s, 1930s, a, um, a common method of doing uh, encryption was by sort of a mechanical generalization of these kinds of Caesar ciphers and Renier ciphers. And so the idea was that you would have essentially these, co these wheels and um, uh, it's kind of like a, a thing with gears where you would have these series of rotors and they, they have, um, and they are basically determining by how many letters to shift things. But they're not just going, like in the Vinaya cipher, it's not just going up by a fixed number of letters every, every time you get to the next place in the, in the message. It's changing the, the, which letter to go to by some much more complicated process that depends on uh, the way these, these gears work. And in the Enigma machine, there were also some other things. There was kind of some electrical wires that connected things to things, which kind of uh, permuted around the different letters and so on. But so the basic point was, message went in, in uh, you know, in German, it's typed in. It's kind of fun that there are, uh, if, you're, if you're into the tourism of Enigma machines, I have, I have a number of friends who have Enigma machines there. They're, they're, I don't know how many of them were made, but they're a decent number that survived. Um, uh, it was a good one, uh, the National Cryptology Museum in, in Maryland. Um, this, when I was last there, had a couple of uh, Enigma machines that you could type on yourself. Um, it's kind of fun to see how they work. Um, the, uh, in any case, actually the Museum of Math in, in New York, I think has an Enigma machine as well. Um, the, uh, um, so in any case, the, the, the Enigma machine was this thing where you're typing in a message, it gets very scrambled, um, and you transmit by radio the scrambled message. Then at the other end, uh, somebody has a, uh, oh, I should have said that on the machine, you're kind of making certain settings that determine how those wheels would, uh, um, would kind of twist and turn to get out the next letter. And so to decode the message, you have to set back up that key of how the wheels would initially get set so that you can then uh, do the reverse of the encoding from the plain text to the cipher text. You can do the reverse to get back the plain text, the original message from the cipher text. And so what would happen is that the key, people would know, oh, on Thursday, we're going to use this key, kind of like a password. On Thursday, we're going to use this password. And, and that information about that on Thursday, that password is going to be used, that would have to be distributed in some way through couriers, through actual people going someplace or, or whatever else. Um, but so uh, what would happen is kind of every day, uh, the um, Germans would set their Enigma machines in um, uh, with a different key. And the British would um, 
uh, be receiving all the radio transmissions. It's easy to get the radio transmissions. You just have to put a radio mast in the right place. Um, and uh, they, would, um, they would get the radio transmissions and what they would get is this encoded message. So it might be uh, E, Q, Z, B, D, X, Y, whatever it is, right? That started as a piece of German text, but then by being encoded by the Enigma machine, it turned into this kind of random, random seeming sequence of letters. Okay, so the, the challenge on the part of the British was figure out what the key that was used for that encoding was, because once they have the key, you can just put it into your own Enigma machine and you can do your own decoding and then you know what the message said. Okay, so, so the challenge was find the key. All right, so what will be a naive way to find the key? Well, you might say that you would just try all the possible keys and, uh, and figure out um, uh, what, um, uh, which key was used. Well, there's a problem with that, just as there is with passwords today, that um, uh, very quickly, you, there are just too many keys to try. And so, and in those days, that was before electronic computers, digital electronic computers existed. Um, it was a very slow thing to try the keys. So at first they would have people trying these keys and so on. So, okay, so the, the, you couldn't try the keys. You couldn't try them every single key. You had to find some way to use the fact that the message would still have, if, if you could only, uh, key in to the fact that the German text that was encoded was not random. Even though what came out seems random, there has to be something non-random about it because it's encoding non-random German text. And so uh, for those who are into these kinds of things, the, um, the idea of information theory, which was um, uh, talked about by Claude Shannon um, uh, just after the Second World War, that came out of kind of this thinking about um, what, when you put in something that isn't random, can, it, what's not, there has to be something non-random about the output because it's reflecting this, this, this non-random thing that went in as the input. And just how much can you extract? How much do you need to know? Um, how, how, how much trace of the non-randomness will there be in the output and so on? Well, okay. So what did uh, uh, the people, the British do to break the Enigma code. So they had this operation at Bletchley Park in England, about, about halfway between Oxford and Cambridge, which are the sort of locations of the, the two top universities in, in those days in England. Um, they kind of had this place where they recruited lots of people from Oxford and Cambridge. I, I knew some of the people who worked at, um, uh, at Bletchley Park many, many years later. Um, and uh, for a long time, everything that was done at Bletchley Park was completely secret. Um, and uh, nobody knew, you know, uh, people would say there's one person I knew who um, uh, had worked there and who really uh, gave a few hints, as I later realized, about his work there, but would never say anything, would never have mentioned anything about the details of what was done there. M many, it took many years before the, um, uh, the work that was done at Bletchley Park um, which was the uh, where where this decoding of the Enigma machines was was uh, made not not secret. Um, uh, people say that the reason it was kept secret for a long time is because even though uh, even after the end of the Second World War, um, there was still a lot of Enigma machines in circulation used by many countries, and um, the British, among others, didn't want people to know that in fact the codes associated with the Enigma machines could be broken. And so that information about what had happened in the Second World War was, was, not, um, was not made public. Okay, so how were the, the codes actually broken? So let's see how much detail. Um, well, essentially the idea was to make clever use of the sort of statistical regularities that existed in this seemingly random output based on the fact that there were statistical regularities in the, in the German that, that came in to the, um, uh, um, uh, to the, to the, uh, as the input. But the actual process of breaking these things was partly done by machine. And there were these things called bombs, B-O-M-B-E's that were made that were essentially things that would try and uh, not go through all the possible combinations 
but would go through a sort of specially selected set of possible combinations that might correspond to the key. And what was done, in fact, was there was a, uh, the technology that existed in those days, as I say, digital electronic computers did not yet exist. The first of those uh, started to be made right after the war, 1946 or so, um, the first serious ones at least. Um, what existed at that time were the uh, switching systems of telephone exchanges. And so in a telephone exchange, an old fashioned telephone exchange, person A is trying to call person B. And basically the wire from person A comes into the telephone exchange and it has to be connected to the wire from person B that's going out of the telephone exchange. And somehow you have to have this whole device that's that's making an electrical connection between those things. And, and that was done using these all these kind of rotor like things that would say, oh, this, this, this number is trying to call this other number, let me make this connection here. Um, and so electronic switching, um, uh, telephone electronic switching equipment was kind of convenient for sort of making connections and trying things out and so on. And that was repurposed to make these kind of uh, early electronic type computers that were used in Bletchley Park. Okay, the story of Alan Turing. How does, Alan Turing is famous these days for having been sort of the uh, original conceptual creator of computers. Um, he worked as a young person at Bletchley Park and he had a particular role in, um, uh, in the breaking of um, the Enigma code. Actually, he worked for a man called Jack Good, who I, oh, I met uh, oh, years ago now, sometime in the 1980s. Um, Jack Good was a statistician person who studies uh, statistical regularities of things. Later on, he also got interested in biology. Actually, he was most notable perhaps in modern culture for having been the person who I think originated this idea of a singularity where AIs would get more and more intelligent and they would eventually get intelligent enough that there would sort of be this infinite run of, of uh, increase in intelligence. But anyway, Jack Good kind of invented that idea, but Jack Good was, was Alan Turing's boss at Bletchley Park. And, um, Alan Turing had essentially a statistics problem that was had to do with how you, instead of having to try all the combinations, how you kind of use statistical methods to reduce the number of combinations that had to be tried. And that was his, his major contribution there. He, he also worked on um, uh, speech encipherment, actually um, interacted with Claude Shannon in the US a bit um, and, uh, and, and various other things uh, during the war. But his, his, his earlier contributions to computing were of a somewhat different character. I mean, Alan Turing, uh, some of us work on these big projects that last for decades. Alan Turing was not a big projects person. Alan Turing worked on a series of very important small projects that lasted for a few years. Um, one of those projects that he worked on in 1936 is the one for which he's most famous these days is the invention of these things called Turing machines. Um, which are, I mean, Alan Turing himself was actually really like tinkering with actual physical machines, but the Turing machine that he's famous for is a, is a, is a conceptual abstract machine, not a physical kind of machine that, that people actually um, in practice build out of things. And the question that he had was, if you were going to do a mathematical computation, if you were going to calculate something or whatever else, how could you make a kind of general uh, kind of model of that process of calculation. Remember, computers didn't exist yet. Um, people had um, uh, mechanical calculators that just worked by um, having kind of um, things a bit like a mechanical odometer where you would have these, these wheels that would go around and the wheel would go around a uh, whole revolution and that would make the next wheel be a carry bit of one and, and so on and so on and so on. So these kind of electro... Um, mechanical and, and actually by then electromechanical um, sort of calculators existed. But the question was, if you were able to do any mathematical calculation you can imagine, how would you set that up as a kind of conceptual type of machine? And so Alan Turing invented this idea of having um, essentially a, a, a thing with a tape where you would write down a series of numbers on this tape and then you just have this at the, you'd have the sort of the main head of the machine would just say, I'm gonna change one of the numbers on this tape. I'm gonna shift the tape left or right and then keep going. And then depending on what number I read from the tape, I'll make a change. Seems like a very simple process. Okay, the big surprising thing that Alan Turing did was to show that if you have a certain machine that looks, that works kind of like that, 
you can make a machine that has that kind of setup where by having the right things initially written on the tape, that machine can be made to act like any other machine of that type. In other words, it's a universal machine. You might have thought that to get a machine that operates in a particular way, you would have to change the hardware of the machine. But what he showed was just by changing what you wrote on the tape at the beginning, then you could make a universal machine that would um, uh, be able to, um, uh, to do any computation one wants. And that idea is what basically has turned into the idea of software on computers. Because the big idea of software is you have a fixed computer. You have your, you know, your Mac laptop or your Windows laptop or whatever, and it's a fixed laptop, and you can run any software you want. You could be running a video conferencing piece of software. You could be running a word processor. You can be running all these different kinds of computations. They all run on the same kind of hardware. It wasn't at all clear that anything like that was possible until the 1930s and until particularly Alan Turing's work on Turing machines. So that was sort of the big contribution there. Uh, what was a big surprise actually was that there were a number of other approaches to thinking about how you would do arbitrary computations that looked very different. There was one called Lambda Calculus, there was one called General Recursive Functions, another one called Combinators. They were developed by other people. And one of the big surprising things was it turned out all these different methods that looked so very different were all equivalent. They could all, you could make a Lambda Calculus thing that would emulate any Turing machine. You could make any Turing machine that would emulate any general recursive function. They were all could be interconverted between each other. And that was kind of the clue that there could be a general purpose computer that could exist. Now, it wasn't clear that, um, I mean, I'll give two footnotes to this that are more my personal contributions to these things. So one of the questions was when you have one of these universal Turing machines, how complicated does it have to be? Does it have to, does it have, you know, in the, the thing that's reading the symbols on the tape, do there have to be 300 kinds of symbols on the tape? And does the, the thing that's reading those have to some, have some very complicated mechanism? People thought um, that the sort of record was that there would be four symbols on the tape and seven states in the head of the Turing machine. That record was, uh, was gotten by a friend of mine named Marvin Minsky back in 1962. So from 1962, um, until much later, that record, that was the record for the simplest universal Turing machine, the simplest way to make a sort of universal computer. Well, as a result of a bunch of science that I did, I kind of suspected there were much, much, much simpler universal Turing machines. And I found one, I found the very simplest possible candidate, which has um, uh, just two states in its head and three symbols that it can put on its tape, three types of symbols it can put on its tape. And I, I kind of came up with that in the probably mid 1990s. I didn't know for sure whether it was in fact a universal computer or not. Then in, in 2007, I put up this prize for somebody to prove or disprove that this was the simplest, this was in fact a universal computer. And a young chap called Alex Smith in England um, in a limited number of months actually came up with yes. He had this very complicated proof that yes, this particular thing is a universal Turing machine. So that means we, we now know the simplest universal Turing machine. It has just two states, three colors. Um, it's very, very, very simple thing. It's so simple that you could imagine that you could, for example, make a molecule that would implement such a machine and make a sort of computer at the size of a, of a molecule. So that, that's um, uh, one, um, uh, one feature of, of um, um, uh, so that was kind of a uh, part of the end of the, of the Turing machine story. I think I was gonna tell you some other things about, I could tell you a lot of stuff about Alan Turing and, and work that he did. And, um, uh, but maybe if people are interested, I can do that, but maybe I'll, I'll move on to another, another topic now. Um, okay, there's a question from Sarah here. Can I explain uh, Newton's, oh, actually, I, I'm sorry, I should say one more thing. This idea about Turing machines and the idea that you can represent any computation as something that a Turing machine can do is, that was sort of an idea that emerged from the work that Alan Turing did in the 1930s. What we didn't know is whether in the physical world, yes, we can build a Turing machine, but could we perhaps build a more powerful kind of computer? Could we perhaps build a computer which even in finite time, in one second, let's say, it could compute something which would take a Turing machine an infinite time to compute. We didn't know whether that was possible in physics or not. 
people suspected up through the 1980s probably that that actually would be something that is possible in physics. And actually there even there are there are both things in ordinary physics and things to do with black holes where it kind of looks like, well, yeah, you should be able to compute things beyond what a Turing machine can compute. Uh, actually, my own work in the, in the early 80s kind of made one kind of think that wasn't so likely, but not so sure. But then recently, uh, as some um, these kind of breakthroughs we've had in, in understanding the fundamental theory of physics, I think we have really pretty good evidence now that no, the universe just does Turing machine type computation. It doesn't do so-called hyper computation that is sort of beyond what Turing machines can do. And in fact, that very fact that the universe only does Turing machine level computation turns out to be a, a critical central fact in understanding how physics works and what's possible in our universe and so on. But so that's kind of the end of the story. When, when Alan Turing invented Turing machines, he just thought that he'd managed to show that among Turing machines, you could have a single universal Turing machine. He had no idea that this would be such a general uh, kind of uh, thing. In fact, he himself, I don't think, believed that Turing machines represented what could happen in physics. When he did some work on physics, he thought that there was something sort of very much beyond Turing machines going on in physics. I think he would have been, uh, I don't think he would have been that surprised actually, but I think he would have found it really interesting to see that actually all the stuff in physics can be done with computations that could be done with a Turing machine. Okay, let's see, on to the next question here. Um, oh, we got lots and lots here, all right. Next question is from Sarah here. Uh, can I explain Newton's second law of motion? Okay, so this is back in 1687. Isaac Newton uh, was the person who kind of brought serious mathematics to physics. Uh, Galileo had done some of this a little bit earlier. People like Archimedes had done versions of this back in, in, in ancient Greek times. But um, Isaac Newton was really the one who, who very seriously brought kind of mathematics and in particular calculus that he invented for this purpose to, to physics. So the question was, could you make, could you explain the physical world using kind of mathematical like principles? Isaac Newton wrote a famous book called his Principia Mathematica. That's just Latin. Uh, that's the Latin for mathematical principles. The full name of Newton's book is in translated into English is Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Natural philosophy was kind of the then name for what we would today call physics. And what Newton was really saying is there are mathematical principles there's mathematics that you can do that explains what happens in the physical world. Before people like Newton, people really hadn't had much of that idea. They really were just sort of reasoning. Uh, it's like, you know, Aristotle, for example, would say, things fall because they have a tendency to go closer to the center of the earth. It's not, it's not kind of, there's mathematics that tells you that the rate at which things fall is proportional to this, is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Newton had the idea of bringing in mathematics that was uh, known for lots of purposes of doing, you know, calculating the area of a field or working out, you know, interest for money and things like this. Mathematics was, was known for many purposes, but Newton really sort of connected mathematics to the physical world. Okay, so what he needed to do then was to say, if we're gonna connect mathematics to the physical world, how does the physical world work? So what was his model for explaining how the physical world works? Well, in mathematics, there are these idea, this idea of an axiom system, uh, a system of rules that describe how something works. So the most famous of those is Euclid's rules for geometry. So Euclid's rules for geometry say things like, for example, if you have two lines that are parallel, they'll never cross. That's true if you have a, if you're on a plane, for example, that'll be true. Or it, for example, another uh, thing would be um, if you have two points, they, um, you can draw a line between them. Or if you, I don't remember all of the axioms, but, but um, there are things like that. Um, and what, what Euclid did was from those axioms, from those statements about sort of how geometry is set up, he proved all these facts. He proved that, you know, the, the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. He proved um, all kinds of other, other results. He proved that there are five platonic solids, you know, the, the, all these kinds of things. He proved all these results by using this kind of axiomatic system that 
he set up for geometry. And I think Euclid in his time thought that his axiomatic system was a, a condensation, a description of how the geometry is set up in the world. Um, well, uh, whether, uh, you know, later on it became clear through the work of Einstein and other people that the geometry as the world sets it up doesn't quite follow the geometry that Euclid said was the way that, that one should set up geometry. But anyway, so Newton, now in 1687, Newton uh, was trying to define uh, how the physical world would worked and he wanted a kind of an axiomatic framework for defining the physical world. And so what he did was he came up with his laws of motion, which I think he viewed as being very similar to Euclid's axioms, very similar to statements like two parallel lines never cross. But instead these were physical facts, like Newton's first law of motion is that an object not acted on by an external force remains in its, uh, in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, keeps going in a constant state of motion. Now, actually that wasn't so obvious in Newton's time. In today's world, if you, oh, I don't know, have a, um, you know, if you have one of those, uh, I don't know, air hockey tables or something where you've got something, a little puck, that has very little friction and you push the puck, the puck will just, you know, you push it with a certain uh, force, it goes with a certain, uh, speed will just keep going with that speed. It won't get slowed down by friction. If there is friction, it'll slow down and, and stop. In Newton's day, uh, there wasn't a lot of stuff that didn't have friction, but nevertheless, Newton said, if you could get rid of friction, then it would be the case that any object, if you just set it in a certain state of motion with a certain velocity, it will just keep going with that velocity and it won't go, it'll go in a straight line forever. Now in, um, uh, you know, in space, away from the gravity of the Earth and so on. Yes, that's how it works. To set a spacecraft going, it'll just keep going. Um, and uh, so that's Newton's first law of motion. Newton's second law of motion is that if you act on something with a force, then there's a formula that says the force you act on it, are, act on it with is equal to the mass of the object times uh, its acceleration. So that says that if you, if you push something with some force, you can make the thing accelerate. So if you take that formula, you can switch it around. It says the acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. So that means if you act on something with a force, that force will cause the thing to accelerate. You push something, it'll accelerate. So that's, that's Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, and in a sense, that law can sort of be thought of as the definition of force, um, but it's also, a, a statement you can you can have other ways to sort of characterize forces. Newton's third law is the statement that uh, to every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you push on something, there will be a, a if if the thing is going to then then something will it, it'll sort of push back on you. In other words, there's sort of an equilibrium of forces that can happen. If you if you have a system that somehow is is initially in a in a in a, in a certain uh, stationary state, then a force pushing one way must be opposed by a force pushing the other way. And sort of a famous example, if you're, um, the famous example, if you're, uh, uh, for somebody like me, who's, who's utterly inept with these things, if you do skateboarding, don't, I, don't, don't look to me to actually be a practical doer of that. But um, if you do skateboarding, then if you uh, sort of uh, jump off your skateboard, um, your skateboard will go in the opposite direction. Um, and that's, that's a consequence of Newton's third law um, to if, if sort of things are in a stationary state to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So Newton's laws were kind of the axiomatic laws that governed uh, the, the mechanics um, of the, was the ways of computing things in mechanics. To that, he added one more fact, which was his universal law of gravitation which said that the gravitational force between two objects is proportional to the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by the square of the distance between the objects, the inverse square law, multiplied by a constant it's called the gravitational constant um, that uh, uh, is, is an overall proportionality constant that tells you how, how large overall the force is. So with those three laws of motion plus his universal law of gravity, Newton was able to compute in principle, at least, 
all kinds of things about the motion of planets and comets and all sorts of other things. The actual computations were difficult. He invented calculus as a way to actually apply those laws to, to represent, uh, for example, a very typical thing in calculus is, you know that something is accelerating, uh, that it, something is accelerating, it has a certain profile of acceleration, it accelerates very fast for a while, then it slows down its acceleration, speeds it up again, okay, how then, what does that mean for where the object got to? So for example, something that falls under the gravity of the earth, it has a fixed acceleration. That's the acceleration due to gravity, about 9.8 meters per second per second. That's the, that the acceleration is the rate at which the speed of the object increases with time. So that 9.8 meters per second per second means that every second, an object that's falling under the earth's gravity increases its speed by 9.8 meters per second. At least it would if there was no air resistance and so on. Um, so, but, but if you know that, you know it's increasing its speed at that rate, the question you can ask is, so how far does the thing actually go? And to do that, you have to work out, uh, in calculus, you would work out an integral. Um, actually, Galileo, even before calculus, had managed to figure this one out, that the, the distance gone is proportional to the square of the time. Um, uh, the, the, under, with a fixed acceleration, like the acceleration due to gravity, the distance the object goes is the square of the time it's been, it's been falling for or whatever. Okay, so anyway, that was, that's, that's kind of in how Newton's laws work. And Newton had figured out, uh, famously figured out um, the elliptical orbits of planets based on those laws, uh, the orbits of comets. Um, and he tried to figure out things like the orbit of the moon, but it turns out just the calculus, the, the, all the different effects there and all the different pieces of the, of the formulas that you have to get, they're just really hard to work out. Just the math is really hard to work out. It took another 150 years before that was, was decently worked out, even though the underlying laws that Newton had were, were perfectly correct for that. Now, Newton's laws continue to be sort of the laws that represent motion. They had a correction in 1905, Einstein's theory of relativity, um, and then his general theory of relativity in 1915 produced some corrections to those laws. So Newton's law says force is equal to mass times acceleration. Actually, it's, um, that's corrected to be mass divided by square root of one minus the speed squared over the speed of light squared. And there are a few other kinds of corrections that get made to these things um, that are the consequences of, of relativity. Um, and uh, well, let's not, um, there are, there's some very subtle corrections to these things that we expect to be the case as a result of our new theory of physics. They won't be things that will be immediately observed in ordinary everyday physics. They might be observed in situations close to black holes where there's very intense gravitational fields, very intense gravity, um, but won't be an, an everyday thing. But so that's the story of, of Newton's second law. Okay, let's see, a question from Gist. Noesis, how much of science is kept secret, either classified by the military or waiting for monetization inside private research labs? It's an interesting question. I mean, in the course of my life, I can talk about things where I've known what's happened, what's not happened on that. Uh, you know, one of the questions is, is it a good idea for everybody to know everything about what's happening in science and what's been discovered in science? Sometimes it seems like a pretty bad idea. Uh, for example, nuclear weapons. How do you make nuclear weapons? Um, well, you know, the more people that know that, the more nuclear weapons will get made and probably the more dangerous of a place the world is likely to be. So that's something which has been, um, uh, some aspects of that have been kept classified, kept classified as secret by the government um, uh, for a long time, ever since nuclear weapons were first developed in, the, in 1945. Um, the, uh, so that's, but it's mostly, I think, details that are secret there. I think there are things about, I don't know, how do you make an X-ray laser? I think there are probably secrets around that still. Um, the, uh, um, there are, there are places where people for a long time had thought this better be secret because otherwise it's a problem. Um, an example of one of those is in cryptography in making coded messages, people had the idea that if you want to have a code that is hard to break, people have to not know how the code works. And that idea persisted pretty much through the 1970s, even into the 1980s. 
And then it became clear that there were reasons that a code could be hard to break that were just mathematical reasons, even if you knew completely how the code worked. If you didn't have the key that would break that particular instance of the code, you still couldn't get it just for mathematical reasons. So the idea that you had to keep code secret pretty much disappeared. There are other things. Um, there are other questions like, for example, a good question is, is it a good idea to have, if you knew the uh, genetic sequence for a really nasty virus that would cause a, a, you know, a, a, a terrible pandemic, even worse than the one that we're in right now, um, should that be kept secret? Should it not be kept secret? Um, and, and how should that be done and so on. I think many people would argue that that was a good thing to keep secret because it's just not that hard to synthesize, you know, eventually to synthesize a, a simple virus. Um, so that's an example of something that sort of should be kept secret. In terms of what has been kept secret and has become not secret, I would say that the, the vast majority that there is, to my knowledge, over the course of my career, I'm thinking what pieces of basic science were secret and then became not secret. There are some around nuclear physics. There are some around cryptography. I think essentially all the pieces of basic science are now uh, not secret anymore. Um, are there things that companies know about how to do things that are secret? Yeah, there, there are certainly ones of those trade secrets of companies and so on about how to make certain things work. I think those tend to be more matters of engineering of, you know, how do we in detail make this piece of code work? How do we in detail make this device work? How do we in detail put ingredients into this particular, you know, drink or something? Um, those are more details than they are basic science. I, I don't think, I maybe I'm not remembering something, but I don't think there's all that much basic science that ends up being kept, uh, being kept secret. I mean, I think that the um, uh, people sometimes have, um, uh, all kinds of wild theories about pieces of science that have been kept secret. Um, I have never really seen any any good evidence of um, uh, of, of those things. Now there are there are you know sort of strange secrets in the world, like you know who invented who was the who was the person behind you know the Bitcoin cryptocurrency and things like that. There are secrets like that, um, but those are more secrets about the doing of things or the details of things than they are about the actual basic science of things. Let's see, oh gosh, all kinds of questions here. Um, uh, there's a question here from the Lantoons. How can we understand the double slit experiment with light? Um, if light's made with particles whose quantum wave functions interfere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, okay. Well, let's see, where do we go with this? So first of all, let me explain what the, um, um, let me explain something people may or may not have seen. So if you, if you drop a stone in a pond, you'll see a, bunch of, you'll see a bunch of circular ripples come out from that stone. Hopefully people have seen that. That's a, a sort of a circular wave that goes ripple, ripple, ripple. It's going the waves, the, the ripples will go up, down, up, down, up, down, in a circular pattern, okay? Okay, now imagine you drop two stones in the pond at the same time. You'll get two patterns of two circular patterns of ripples, but somewhere in the middle, those two patterns of ripples will interfere. There'll be, there'll be places in the water where there's ripples from one stone and ripples from the other stone. What happens there? So what happens is whenever the, the sort of the, the up piece of a ripple um, meets the up piece of the other ripple, you'll get a double height ripple. Whenever you get two down pieces meeting, you get a double down piece of ripple. But when you have an up ripple from one side and a down ripple from the other side, then you'll get, um, uh, then they will destructively interfere and that particular piece of water will be flat. So that's the phenomenon of interference between waves. Okay, the same thing happens with light. And people have wondered for a long time is light up, like more like a particle, a stream of photon particles, or is it more like a wave? And in fact, in the, in the theory of quantum mechanics, it's kind of a mixture of a, a wave and a particle. You can view it in a different sort of mathematical way. You can view it in either one of those cases. Viewed as a wave, it uh, this sort of rippling effect and interference between ripples is what you expect and you have interference in light. 
even in terms of particles, it's not so clear how that interference works because like, well, two photons meet and why do two photons, you know, you'd think you have two photons meet, you get two photons. Well, sometimes you get actually zero photons, they destructively interfere. Okay, how does this work? Well, there's a mathematical theory of how it works in standard quantum mechanics. In our theory of physics, we actually have a real explanation of how this works, um, which is something that is sort of very new and let me see whether I have even a hope of being able to explain this. All right, let, let's give it a try. So in ordinary physics, one of the things that one thinks happens is that you, you have a, a, a ball, it's thrown in a certain direction. The ball follows a particular trajectory. It just goes in whichever way it goes. In quantum mechanics, there's a different picture. Instead of there being a definite trajectory for the ball, there actually is a whole collection of possible trajectories. Like at every moment, the ball can choose many different directions to go in. And there's this whole network of all these different directions the ball could go. And these different directions, uh, you could, for example, the ball could go one way, it could go the other way. And then later on, it could go back that way, back this way. And then in the end, even though it followed two different paths, the ball could end up back in the same place. Okay, that phenomenon of what we call a multi-way system is this phenomenon of, of, of tree of going to all these possible possibilities. We call that a multi-way system because it, it follows all these different ways of going, all the possible ways of going. Okay, so an important feature of the multi-way systems that we think correspond to physics is that anytime there's a branch, Anytime it can go in two different ways, there will always be a merging of those two branches. Uh, it's a phenomenon we call causal invariance for reasons that are a little bit um, difficult to explain. But, but um, okay, so, so anyway, any, anytime it branches, it merges. The, these possible paths of behavior. Okay, well, this notion of all these different possible branches, these are not branches happening in physical space, in the space that we know about. It's possibilities of how things work in a, in a different kind of space. We call it branchial space, the space of possible branches. And um, the what we humans, this is again, is a little bit hard to explain. We humans exist in this kind of multi-branching uh, 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 world and we too are showing these kinds of branchings uh, and our whole perception of things is based on we're branching, the world is branching. We kind of, when we untangle this, we realize that we are sort of, uh, we are sensitive to a certain sampling of this kind of elaborately branching, uh, sort of in this, in this branchial space, we are sensitive to uh, sort of certain, we, we are, just as we are localized in space, we exist at a, you know, I'm in this particular place. So similarly in branchial space, our perception of how the universe works is sort of roughly localized in branchial space. It's not quite right, but it's, it's a good, good first approximation. Okay, so what happens in the case of these photons? These photons, they may be moving in physical space, but they're also, going through all these different paths in branchial space. And what ends up happening is that essentially when we are observing uh, a photon arriving somewhere, we are localized in branchial space. And these photons that might go in these two different directions, they basically never reach us in branchial space. This destructive interference phenomenon is essentially the result of the, the, these photons going to different places in branchial space that are far from where we detect them. Not in physical space. In physical space, the photons might be in exactly the same place, but in branchial space, they're in different places. This is slightly hard to understand and I'm condensing a lot of kind of new physics that we figured out, but that's kind of, kind of how that works. Um, and uh, uh, gosh, a lot more to say about that. All right, let me try and address a few more questions here from Alec. Why does no time pass at the speed of light? Ah, well, uh, 
Let's see. So let me explain what, what does it, we understand this much more clearly in our new theory of physics. Um, although in this respect, it's actually maps well into existing theories of physics. Okay. Uh, the question is, how do we perceive anything to happen in the universe? In a sense, we can imagine that in the universe, there are lots of events happening. Those events happen, we can say they happen at a certain place in space, they happen at a certain time, but basically one event, and the event could be, I don't know, a particle disintegrates. The event could be two, uh, two things collide. I don't know, all kinds of events. But one thing you can definitely ask is, uh, which event, in order for a particular event to happen, which other events had to have happened before it in order for it to be able to happen? If you think about it in terms of com computation, it's like you are computing something. What inputs do you need to your computation that were outputs from a previous computation? Okay, so tricky thing is if you are looking at what things depend on uh, what a particular event, what can it affect in what can it subsequently affect? Well, that event is, it can affect things that happen at the same place that it happened later in time. But what about something on the other side of the universe? Can the event that happened here affect something on the other side of the universe? Well, no, not immediately, because the speed of light is the maximum speed that, that anything can travel at. And in order for a particular event here to affect something far away, there has to be information about that event that travels to the place far away. And the maximum speed that that can travel at is the speed of light. Okay, so the, the thing to understand is that in the end, there's this kind of causal graph, this causal network that's built up in the universe that says this event happened, its effects propagated at the speed of light to other places, it could affect these other events. But eventually there's this causal network that says this event affects this event affects this event and so on. But in a sense for, and we are part of that whole causal graph of, of events. Our brains are sensing there are events going on in our brains that are the result of events that we observe elsewhere and so on. We, we see something happen and so something happens in our brain as a result of seeing that we think this thing, whatever else. Okay. So what, what happens then is that the, um, the thing that, uh, so, so uh, this, we have this, we're part of this causal graph of what connects to what. And everything that happens inside us and what we sense in the outside world and so on, it's all limited by the speed of light. The, the sort of the edges in this causal graph, the, the how an events are connected to events. Um, they, those things, if we were to say, you know, after a certain time elapses, the maximum distance away that an event can be is the speed of light multiplied by that time. It's the distance light could go in that time. Okay, so then what happens? Well, essentially, if, if, if time is going to pass, if we are going to perceive time as having passed, that will happen because lots of events have happened for us. We've got lots of things have sort of gone on for us. We can tell time passed, things happened, okay? But, but now what, what happens is if you are on, um, if you're going at the speed of light, if you're, uh, so, yeah, if, if you're going at the speed of light, essentially you don't get kind of the, the, the um, you don't get a chance to think about, to, to have other things happening. The, the only thing that can happen is that you're moving through space as quickly as you can. So the things that represent the passage of time sort of can't happen for you because you're putting all of your, all of your sort of, everything that happens to you is devoted to moving in space. You don't get to use any of the, the what we think of as computation actually that is going on inside you. You don't get to use any of that computation that's going on inside you to, to have sort of time progress Instead, you're using up all that computation to essentially move in space. That's a very rough way of understanding um, why it will seem to be the case that if, if we were going at the speed of light, 
in order to move at that speed, we kind of have to use all our computation just in moving. And so we don't kind of perceive any time to have passed. Now, I, I should have perhaps said at the beginning that in the special theory of relativity, in relativity theory, um, that has the feature that uh, time slows down as you go faster. So the, the apparent, for us, looking at something that is going at the speed of light, it will or going very close to the speed of light, the apparent rate of time will be slower and slower and slower as the thing approaches the speed of light and right at the speed of light, it'll just freeze and no time will seem to have passed. So somewhat confusingly, I mean, if, 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 if we were photons, uh, particles of light, and we were created at the beginning of the universe, the universe became transparent to photons around uh, um, uh, 100,000 years after the beginning of the universe. From that time until now, a photon could have just been traveling at the speed of light through space. And if we were somehow existed in that photon, if our consciousness, if our brains were in that photon, so to speak, traveling at the speed of light, no time would have seemed to have passed from the beginning of the universe until now. Um, and that's, that's a feature of the sort of all of the computational effort of the photon in some sense is spent having it move through space and it doesn't sort of have the opportunity to use that some of that computation to make it kind of progress with time. I mean, that's a, a very, um, it's a bit of a, actually what I just told you is a, is a more, more of a genuine explanation for this phenomenon called time dilation than one really has, has had before. Um, I mean, that's based on sort of uh, some indications of this, this theory of physics that we have. Before, what people have said is, it's just an axiomatic fact that the speed of light is constant. And then from that, it follows a bunch of things. And you can deduce that it has to be the case that there's time dilation and so on. What I've tried to give you is a little bit more of a, a more sort of mechanical explanation of why time dilation happens. Um, Let's see. Oh gosh, so many interesting questions. Um, unfortunately, I'm kind of running out of time here, but um, 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 let's see. All right, we got a couple of fun questions that I might try and talk about. So there's a question here. I had talked earlier about Alan Turing, uh, particularly in connection with the breaking of the Enigma code. Um, and someone said computers were inspired by Turing's work. That's actually a complicated piece of history. So Alan Turing in 1936 proved that as a mathematical possibility, there were these so-called universal Turing machines. It was possible to have a fixed mathematical model of a computational device that could at least do all the computations that any mathematical model of that type could do. Okay, so that was sort of thing number one. Thing number two, people had electromechanical calculators, which did particular calculations, you know, they would work out square roots, they would work out this, they would work out that. People have thought about, actually mostly a couple of people, in the 1800s, in the 1840s and things, had thought about the idea of taking these, at that point, purely mechanical calculators and somehow making them programmable. Kind of the idea, this was an idea of Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace, um, of uh, being able to have punch cards, cards where you just punch out holes and there's a a sort of a mechanical device that senses where the holes are. And you could kind of use that mechanical device to determine which wheels, which cogs would engage with which other cogs to determine what calculation would be done by this mechanical device. And particularly Ada Lovelace had a pretty good description back in the 1840s of kind of conceptually how one would make what in those days they called an analytical engine um, that would be able to take uh, programs, they didn't call them programs in those days, um, that um, uh, to describe how different computations could be done. Well, the general idea that that analytical engine was never built, 
would have been the size of a large, you know, train locomotive in those days. And it would have been a very expensive object and the project was poorly managed. And it's a whole long elaborate story that I, whose history I happen to have studied, I could tell you about in great detail. It's an interesting story of people. And um, it's kind of a, in the end, it's a sad story because Ada Lovelace, um, who I think under Charles Babbage was more of an engineer. Ada was more somebody who was really just thought of herself as an expositor of what was going on, but basically she understood more deeply than, than, than Charles Babbage did sort of what the real point of this analytical engine would be. And she wrote this very, very nice um, uh, uh, essay about it, famously saying in, in traditional Victorian English, you know, the analytical engine will weave algebraical patterns um, much as the Jacquard loom, uh, you know, uh, weaving machine will weave pictures of birds and flowers. Um, her algebraical patterns, she thought of, a, she thought about computer generated music. She thought about all kinds of mathematical calculations and so on as algebraical patterns in her Victorian English. Um, but in any case, so, so that idea was sort of around um, people have been building these mechanical and electromechanical and even ele electrical, electronic computers, electronic calculators that would do just mathematical calculations, work out square roots, do this, do that. Okay, then around um, in the 1940s, by the beginning, by about 1940, people um, began to have the idea that maybe you could have a calculator, an electromechanical calculator that will be somehow programmable, that, that instead of a person setting up how the cogs would be set up and how the connections and the wires would be set up, there would be some automatic way to do that. Uh, a chap called Vincent Atanasoff was a famous one who had, he was a physicist, who, um, who set up a, a, a kind of a, an early machine that did that. But um, so there was this kind of whole tradition of um, sort of, well, it's, it's, it's something where, well, you could set it up by hand, but you could kind of automate setting, setting up the calculation. And that was kind of emerging as a way to do computation. So by the end of World War II, uh, 1946 or so, there started to be machines that were uh, more, in a more streamlined way, had sort of stored programs that would be the things that set up the calculations they would do. Famously, one called the ENIAC, built in, in uh, Philadelphia, near Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Um, the, um, uh, and that was, so there was this whole idea of kind of this, you could set up a computer and you could give it these instructions that said, you know, add numbers, multiply numbers, do this, do that, do these calculational things. Alan Turing's mathematical Turing machines didn't have things like arithmetic in them. They were much more just conceptually, you can compute things. You'd have to build that up, um, build up arithmetic from lower level constructs. Okay, so in fact, those two traditions of m practically making electrical calculators and, and, and practically and thinking about the mathematics of computation were really two different traditions. They strangely merged in, in 1943, I guess, there were these chaps, uh, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts, who were uh, kind of trying to make a model of the brain. And they knew that, that neurons in the brain were electrical. And they thought, aha, you know, these are electrical. We've got these ele electrical calculator-like things. Uh, and you know, is the brain like a giant calculator? Oh, but we've also got this idea of Alan Turing's over here about how you can make a universal thing that's sort of in a calculator like we're made up of wires and things like that. And so they showed that their kind of conceptual model of how brains worked with you know, wires for neurons and things like that could be universal in the same sense that Alan Turing's Turing machine was universal. So they kind of brought together that at a, a sort of mathematical level. And in those days, particularly fields like uh, psychology, psychiatry and so on, were really uh, sort of leading the charge in science in certain ways. And so it was very, uh, it was a very, very hot area. Um, and this was the thing that was done as a sort of matter of, uh, in a sense, mathematical psychology, you could call it. So, okay, so that happened, it was a model for the brain. So then what happened was, uh, particularly a chap called John von Neumann, who was a, a mathematician primarily, um, uh, who um, uh, I've heard many stories about, he died before I was born, but I, uh, I've known many people who knew him, um, a very, very quick fellow, uh, who would always be able to sort of answer problems quickly. Anyway, 
he came in as a consultant actually to IBM about how to make computers. He, he famously made various predictions like only the world will only ever need five computers, which turned out not to be a great piece of uh, foreseeing the future. Um, he also, I, I think, had um, uh, well various other predictions, which were which were interesting mistakes. I mean, they were they were mistakes because of just not foreseeing uh, how things would play out and, and what would be possible and so on. But in any case, so through him and, and and other people around him, this kind of idea about how brains worked, which had made use of Alan Turing's work, kind of merged with the sort of practical thread of let's just make electrical computers. Um, and that sort of that became something where there was a more slightly more theoretically based approach to making computers. I mean, the earliest computers were made primarily for ballistics computations. Um, originally, they were made to compute, uh, you know, you fire a, a big gun and you point it up at a certain angle and it's going to fire a shell and the shell is going to go 10 miles. Where exactly is the shell going to land given air resistance, given the rotation of the earth, given all those things? To work that out was a job for a computer. Uh, before there had been electronic computers, there were people who would be actually carefully calculating, you know, by hand all of these different, you know, the wind velocity is this, do this, do this, do this. Actually, they would have ballistics tables, but when they were dealing with more elaborate calculations of, you know, a gun that had never been fired before or a missile that was going to be fired, something like that, it was a question of, you know, human computers. Uh, usually they got spelled a different way. Computer, uh, the electronic thing is, is an ER at the end. I think the, the humans often themed themselves with an OR at the end, computers. Um, and uh, there, were, there were lots of people who, who did that. It was a, it was a kind of common um, activity. In fact, my, my friend physicist, uh, Dick Feynman, was in charge of the human computers who worked on the Manhattan Project uh, for building um, the first uh, the first atomic bomb in during World War II, um, and and that the calculations for that were all done by human computers, so to speak, not by anything um, by by by, uh, and they had mechanical calculators and things, but um, uh, not um, uh, not by our modern digital computers. So that's kind of the story of that. Um, Well, the uh, yeah, uh, someone's commenting on Ada Lovelace as being the first programmer. Yeah, I think that's a fair. I, I have studied this history in quite a lot of detail. I think that's a a fair thing to say. She had a, she really wrote out in her sort of exposition of the analytical engine. She wrote out, "This is what the um, you know these are the instructions that um, the analytical engine um, uh, um, would follow." And actually she had a particular calculation. She computed these mathematical things called Bernoulli numbers. And actually it's sort of a funny story behind those. Bernoulli numbers come out from um, uh, working out, when you do algebra, you can work out um, um, the, um, uh, the, the um, you're, you're working out um, various sort of products of algebraic expressions and so on. And um, you, can, uh, you can work these out by hand but actually in the 1700s, a chap called Bernoulli, forget which Bernoulli, maybe Jacob Bernoulli, I'm not sure. There's a whole family of mathematicians with many, many, three generations of many mathematicians but, and with all with last name Bernoulli. But anyway, one of the Bernoullis was very proud because they worked out a sort of mathematical shortcut for doing all of the calculations that were needed to come up with these uh, coefficients in these algebraic expansions. And those, that sort of shortcut uh, the, the condensation of that shortcut became called Bernoulli numbers, and you can compute the Bernoulli numbers using this uh, equation where the Bernoulli number, the nth Bernoulli number, is def defined in terms of earlier Bernoulli numbers for smaller values of n. So anyway, um, Ada Lovelace chose the computation of Bernoulli numbers as her example for the first program, I suspect knowing that Bernoulli himself, uh, 100 years earlier, had used it as a dramatic shortcut for some yet longer computation. Anyway, so she wanted to show that the analytical engine could compute Bernoulli numbers. And so she wrote out the series of steps that include some loops and things for doing, uh, for doing Bernoulli numbers. Her loops are a little bit hicky in terms of the way they work. Um, actually, I, I tried to translate uh, Ada's 
code into modern Wolfram language code. And it's a little bit, it has a couple of bugs and a little bit, little bit, a uh, little bit tricky. But the basic idea of set up, write out a series of abstract instructions that could be operated on a mechanical device, that was something that Ada Lovelace really, really was the one to figure out. I mean, what became necessary after that to make a more so th theoretical view was the very the idea of a function. People learn the idea of a function when they learn about, um, I guess, when they learn about calculus. Um, it's a mathematical idea. It took an incredibly long time for people to understand the idea of a function. A function, you know, f of x. What does it mean? It's just today, we just think, well, you have a program. You give it the value, you know, you, x is 2, f squares the, 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 the number it's given as its, as its argument and comes out with 2 squared. You give it 3, comes out with 3 squared. This idea of an abstract function f which maybe you didn't necessarily say what it does yet. You just say, it's a function. And you could like say, you apply the function f, you apply the function to the function f of f of x. You can talk about the function abstractly. That idea of an abstract function took a really, really long time to arise in mathematics. It wasn't really clear until the end of the 1800s. And that was kind of what was necessary for the kind of run up to things like ideas like Turing machines. And that's not something that, that um, uh, existed in the time of Ada Lovelace. And, and so that, that kind of theoretical development wasn't really possible yet at that time. But yes, I think that it's fair to say that, that um, uh, Ada was kind of the first programmer, although she only got to do, you know, uh, what do they call it in, in modern computer science classes? Um, oh gosh, what is it called? It's kind of a pen and paper uh, programming, not, um, she didn't have a, a computer to run her computation on, or she would have found that it had bugs in it, I'm sure. Uh, those bugs might have in those days, you know, the if they had built the analytical engine, as I said, it would have been a thing the size of a large train locomotive. Um, and, uh, you know, it would have been the thing full of all these cogs and gears and things. And, you know, probably a bug would manifest itself in grind, 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 crank, crank, crank. And some gear would, would get sort of uh, uh, forced with, you know, high force and would break a gear tooth and the whole thing would blow up or something. That would be the dramatic version of a, of a bug back in those days. Um, there's a question, where does the word compute in English come from? I think in, in Latin, it's computo, computare, I think. It already exists in Latin. I think it means in, in, uh, in ancient times, it meant to reckon, to, to calculate. In, um, uh, um, in um, uh, you know, to, to calculate out something, like to, to figure out, you know, oh, I'm buying three sheep. How much is that? If one sheep costs this amount, how much do three sheep cost? I think that was the, um, the Latin word for that. I don't know its, it's earlier origin. I know that in, in most languages, you know, compute is one of the roots, ordinateur, like in French, it's ordinateur. That's a, that's a common root. Um, I think there are some languages, I think, I think if I remember correctly, there, there, there are a few languages that have sort of unique roots for the word for computer. I think in Icelandic, Icelandic I think is a language which tries not to invent new words. So it has to recycle old ones. And I think the word for computer is, um, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's the words for like uh, wizardess of numbers or something. Those two words put together, I think, is the, is the word in Icelandic, or something, I don't remember, but um, uh, for computer. Um, but, um, uh, well, okay, there's a question here, um, which I think I should, uh, about why is the von Neumann architecture for computers still dominating? So, so one of the things, and this will be my last question for today, um, one of the questions about a computer is uh, a computer, uh, it operates, it, it does a series of instructions. The program that you give a computer says, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. There's a question of is, is there just one stream of instructions that the computer does or does it get told, do all these things in parallel, do all these different calculations or maybe, maybe one part of the computer does this, another part of the computer does that and so on and so on and so on. That's so the, the ordinary way of doing things is often called serial sequential computation. Do this followed by that, followed by that, followed by that. The other way where lots of things happen all at the same time is, is called parallel computation. Well, uh, one of the things that, uh, and so many, many modern computers 
I, sh I should say that that um, uh, there is a form of parallel computation that has become pretty common these days, which is what's done in GPUs, graphics processing units, uh, which are kind of uh, uh, things that exist in most computers, but originally developed for helping with the graphics that will be displayed on computers, but now they're used for more general purposes. In a GPU, um, it is often the case that you'll have a whole long list of numbers and you'll do the same operation to all those numbers, but it'll be done in parallel to all the numbers in that list. So if you've got um, sort of all the pixels representing some region on the screen, you're doing the same operation to the values of all those pixels and that can happen uh, sort of in, in parallel in a GPU. The circuitry of a GPU is set up to be able to do that. Now, a more interesting case is you have lots of different circuitry and, and, and all the computers, are, all the different pieces are doing different things. So it's pretty common in modern computers to have a multi-core CPU. That means there are different, uh, that there are different sort of pieces of the CPU that can do different computations. But within each CPU, within each core, there's typically a sequence of instructions that are executed. And, uh, and if you look on your computer, you'll find that there are your operating system of your computer is usually running many, many different programs, but each one is sequentially running in one of the cores of your computer. And it may, it'll run one program for a while, then it'll stop and it'll start running another program and so on. All, um, you know, it, it, it controls how that works. That's one of the big functions of an operating system. But okay, so the question is why isn't it the case that one just has computers where lots of different things, where there are lots of different pieces to the computer and they're all doing different things and, and somehow they all come together to get you the answer you want? Okay, why isn't it done that way? Well, it could be done very efficiently, probably, if it was done that way. The big problem is it's really hard for us to understand what's going on. It's hard enough for us to write programs that work that are sequential programs. Writing parallel programs that work is even vastly more difficult. Um, because you have to kind of think, oh, if this happened before this, well, this needs the, the result of this thing before it can go on. How do I get the kind of the result from this to be ready before the result from that? Oh, what happens if this other thing um, doesn't have the results from this other thing in time? Oh, it's going to stop and it's not going to be able to do anything until it gets these other results. It's very hard for us to in our brains understand how to do parallel programming. And, that, and that's the main reason parallel programming hasn't become more popular. Um, now, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, when we do ordinary sequential programming, the way that we can do it these days well is to, you know, the computer has certain instructions that it's doing. We in our brains have certain ways to think about how computation should happen. I've spent a large part of my life trying to build a computational language that bridges that kind of divide between how we think about things and how computers do things. So our Wolfram language is sort of the, the, uh, the highest level example of a kind of bridge between our way of thinking about things computationally and what computers actually do. And actually, if you look in Wolfram language, there are many things, there are many sort of uh, operations in the language which are in effect doing things in parallel, but we think of them and sort of one go. So for example, there might be an operation like just, just adding one to a list of numbers. Okay, you've got a whole list of a million numbers. You say plus one. Okay, it, it then will just in parallel add one to all those million numbers. That's an easy thing for us to understand. There are more elaborate operations. I don't know, there's an operation called folding. Um, that's a slightly more elaborate operation where you're sequential, where you're where you're accumulating things. That's something that can be done in part in parallel. There's 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 all kinds of other things that you can do in parallel. Although we manage to to encapsulate them, we manage to put them into operations that we can think of as sort of one lump of computation. So we don't have to get our brains wrapped around this whole all these parallel things happening. We can just think of it. Oh, it's it's an operation. It does this. Inside, things are happening in parallel, um, and even we can sometimes implement them in parallel on computers, but for us, conceptually, they're still sequential. Now, an interesting challenge is, is there a way of presenting essentially a language for computation that can represent parallel things in a way that we humans can really wrap our brains around it? And I've thought about this question since the 1980s, I worked quite a bit on a, a massively parallel computer that had 60,000 processors um, back in the mid 1980s. 
Um, and it was very hard to figure out how to program a thing like that. And, uh, and so, but it got me thinking, how would you think about doing that kind of thing? Okay, so here's the big surprise, to me at least. The things we've done in physics recently, I think finally give us a way to potentially understand how to do that kind of programming of lots of things in parallel. Here's why that's not so surprising after the fact. If we think about physics, we're thinking about things happening in the universe, and we think about everything that happens in the universe being a little computation going on. But what's happening in the universe is a computation is happening here, another computation is happening here. Somehow those computations have to become compatible in some way. They have to be, they have to, uh, but this notion of parallel computation, it's happening all over the universe. And in fact, this whole ambiguity about what happened first, what didn't happen first, that ambiguity actually turns out to be the essence of quantum mechanics and physics. And in fact, for people who know about these things, uh, the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics is basically directly related to what are called race conditions in uh, uh, where, where two different processes are kind of racing for which we'll get the answer first um, and, and a, a locking up until one of them has, has got to the end in parallel computing. So in fact, the ideas from physics turn out, it seems, to be uh, precisely related to, did I just lose this? Ah, let's see what happens here. Oh, that's odd. Okay, maybe this is still working. Um, anyway, I was saying that, that um, these ideas of parallel computing uh, turn out to be exactly what um, uh, um, what sort of seems to be needed in physics and seems to correspond to what's happening in physics. So I think that there is an opportunity to use kind of ideas from physics to give us finally a way to think about programming things in parallel and all relates to things about reference frames and relativity, all kinds of other things. All right, I think I should wrap up here. Uh, thanks very much, and um, uh, look forward to uh, going on, hopefully, uh, next week. <laughs>